Okay, let's try another practice exam. What do we have here? We've got a tertiary alcohol and we've got some sulfuric acid and it's hot. Remember this little triangle means that it is hot where we've got heat. So what are we gonna do? Well, we've got acid, so we're gonna protonate something. And what is the only thing that can be protonated? Certainly it is the hydroxyl, right? We've uh, Oxygen has lone pairs that can be uh, protonated. So let's protonate that thing. So we've got that, we've got, let's call it H2O plus, and then we've got methyl, and we've got methyl. So we have uh, protonated our hydroxyl, and now what can happen? Uh, water is an excellent leaving group, and this is a tertiary carbon, so this is actually fine to go and leave. So uh, let's have that leave, and uh, that will leave us with this situation here. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So this will flatten out. It will now no longer be correct to draw wedges and dashes because we went from an sp3 center, that is tetrahedral geometry, to an sp2 center. There is no, there is no implied hydrogen here. This carbon has three electron domains. It's sp2 hybridized, therefore trigonal planar. So this is flat at this uh, center right here. Uh, and then what can we do? Well, uh, we've got water lying around. Uh, I mean, presumably this is in aqueous conditions, but even if not, a water molecule just left over there. So we've got water. Uh, we're going to complete the E1D. This is an E1 dehydration, essentially. And uh, so we're going to want to finish the elimination. So we could get protons from here, protons from here, or protons from here. And we're going to get a proton from there because this is a very small base uh, and we're going to go Zeitzef. We're going to get the Zeitzef uh, elimination product. We're going to get the more substituted product because it is more thermodynamically favorable and water is not sterically hindered. So it has equal access to all of the protons. So we're going to get that internal proton there rather than a terminal proton. And we will get this uh, E1D product there as our alkyne. So remember, whenever you've got acid, uh, we've got to uh, protonate something. Hydroxyl is the only thing that's going to protonate. Now we've got water, and because this is a tertiary center, this can leave. We get a tertiary carbocation, and then water will go and eliminate. We get our elimination uh, product. We're going to get the Zeitzef elimination product. So that is that one there. Okay, couple multiple choice. Which reaction of the following alkyl halide is stereospecific? So we're going to get only one stereoisomer as a product. So E1 and SN1, what is the first step of those? That both involves the leaving group leaving, which would give us this. And so if we have that, there's no way to get stereospecificity. Uh, first of all, E1 we're eliminating, so that doesn't even make sense. SN1, we would get a racemic mixture. The incoming nucleophile could attack from either side, so that would be not stereospecific. So, oops, let's uh, erase this. So we don't want that. What we do understand is that SN2 is the answer, right? If we were to do SN2 uh, with some nucleophile, uh, some nucleophile could go and attack right there, kick off the bromine, and we would get uh, inversion of stereochemistry. This is stereospecific because the nucleophile has to access the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, which happens to be 180 degrees away, uh, 180 degrees on the other side of this carbon-bromine bond. So it has to approach from a very specific direction in order to perform SN2, and that is what makes this stereospecific. We will invert the stereochemistry there. So that's SN2. Okay, next, what is the maximum number of sets of proton NMR resonances for the following alcohol? So we got to know how many chemically inequivalent protons there are. So first of all, let's go ahead and draw all of the protons. So let's make sure we have them all. So we have an implied hydrogen on the dash right there. We have two hydrogens here. We have two hydrogens here. We have one hydrogen there, and we have one hydrogen there. So we've got two, four, six, eight protons to worry about. How many resonances are we going to get? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the, pro uh, the hydroxyl proton will be its own resonance, certainly. <clears throat> this proton will be its own resonance because it's very close to the hydroxyl. And then these four are all chemically equivalent, right? They're certainly equivalent with each other on each CH2, but then also with each other due to the symmetry of the molecule, right? We can see 
that this uh, molecule has a plane of symmetry. So these groups of hydrogens are, are equivalent with one another. Uh, and then we've got uh, these two are the same because, uh, again, of the plane of symmetry. So we've got one, two, three, four resonance, re resonances that we are going to find on this, uh, on, uh, for the spectrum that corresponds with this molecule. Okay, use IUPAC nomenclature to write the systematic name of the following compound. So we have this one. We don't have to worry about the parent chain. It's very clear that it is just the left to right uh, thing that we can see right here. But we got to number it, and we do have a hydroxyl group. And the hydroxyl group takes priority for numbering the carbon chain. So it doesn't matter. So we're not looking at methyl versus bromo, although bromo would win anyway. But we do want to number so as to give the specifically the hydroxyl occurring soonest, no matter what else is going on. So we have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've got a heptane or rather a heptanol. So uh, we've got three heptanol. We know that much. And then we have a uh, we have a six methyl, and we have a two bromo. But the thing is, we've got two chiral centers. We've got two chiral centers to worry about. That's carbons two and three. And so we've got to assign some stereochemistry here. So let's actually get rid of these uh, numbers because we're going to be writing a lot of numbers to do the Conningwood prelog stuff. So we don't want to jumble it up. Let's start with this one here. We're going to start with this carbon. Uh, so carbon two, uh, we're, gonna, we're talking about this one right here. Uh, let's assign the priorities. So bromine is going to be a priority one by atomic number. And hydrogen is certainly going to be priority four. Carbon, carbon, these two tie, but this carbon is attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. This one is attached to carbon, carbon, oxygen. So this one is going to be priority two. This one is going to be priority three. Now we already have the lowest priority group away from us. So that makes it very easy. We can just go one, two, three like this. That is counterclockwise and that is S. So this is S. Carbon two is an S stereocenter. Okay, now let's do number three. So let's actually erase this stuff because it's going to get very confusing. Uh, so let's do the same thing. Let's assign the priorities. So oxygen is going to be priority one because it is a heavy. It has a higher atomic number than carbon. But carbon, 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 those all tie. This carbon is attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So that will actually be the lowest priority. These two carbons. This one is attached to hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. This is attached to hydrogen, carbon, bromine. So this will win because of the bromine, and we'll go that way. Now we do have the lowest priority group towards us. So what we can do in such case is we can, uh, we can arbitrarily swap the highest and lowest priority. So let's pretend that the oxygen is on the wedge and the methyl is on the dash. If we pretend that the oxygen, that the hydroxyl is on the wedge, then we could go one, two, three like this, and we would say that it would be S. However, we inverted that stereocenter in order to be able to do that, so we must therefore invert our answer, and our answer will therefore be R. So carbon three, is uh, is R. <clears throat> so we've got everything we need. Now we just list it, and we 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 list the stereochemistry first. So we have two S, three R, and we do it like this: parentheses, comma, in between the stereocenters, and then we list what we've got. We've got two bromo. Remember uh, B for bromo uh, first because of alphabeticity. Then six methyl comes next, and then three heptanol. 2S, two, 3R, two 2-bromo, two 6-methyl, 3-heptanol. That will be the name of this. Okay, explain why the following reaction is highly regioselective. So we're going to get a lot of this, and not uh, we're not going to get this, right? We're, we're going to get pretty much just this. So draw an appropriate three-dimensional conformation of the starting material 1, and use the curved arrow notation. So we're going to show the mechanism. So we got to show the chair. Remember, always, 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 when we're doing elimination, right? This is an elimination reaction because we've got terp-butoxide, right? Terp-butoxide is your classic E2 promoter. We see that thing. We know we're almost certainly going to be going E2. Uh, but we have a cyclohexane derivative as a starting material. And when you have a cyclohexane derivative, you've got to draw the chair. Otherwise, you don't know what is going on uh, sufficiently to be able to say 
which proton will be extracted in elimination. Sorry, I'm having a tough time with my chairs today. So let's do that. Okay, that's a decent chair. So I like to put my leaving group on the edge most carbon. That's just the way I like to do it. You can do it however you want, uh, but I'm going to take the bromine here and put and point it up as the wedge bond would demand. So the first group that you put on there is arbitrary, but once you put one group on there, the other groups are not arbitrary. They are dictated by the way you put that first group on there. So if we go one carbon clockwise, we need a propyl group pointing up and the up, uh, the up direction on this carbon is equatorial. So I didn't decide that it was equatorial, the chair decided that for me, right? Because this, the up position on this carbon is the equatorial position. Then if we go one counterclockwise, we've got the methyl going down, and so here, that will be that. So we need to do, uh, we need to do uh, elimination and so we need a proton. Well, which protons are, uh, well, first of all, let's draw all the beta protons. We've got a beta proton here, and we've got a beta proton here. But the thing is, in order to do E2 on a cyclic system, we need to have both the proton being extracted and the leaving group in the axial position, because that is the only way we're going to jet, we need them to be anti-paraplanar to one another in order to get the appropriate uh, overlap of the, of the p orbitals that is going to be responsible for the pi bond that is being produced. So what that means is that terbutoxide can only get this proton. It cannot get this proton because this proton is equatorial. This proton is axial, so we can uh, do elimination from here. We're going to kick that off, and that is what brings us to the desired product, right? Because we have the double bond. In, uh, the double bond is stemming from the carbon with the propyl group, right? We're getting that here. So uh, if we wanted to, uh, if we wanted to draw it on this, this is how we would draw it on the regular uh, line notation, right? We would go like that and kick that off. And so that's why we get the pi bond exclusively there. Uh, so that's that one, and that's the end of this one. It was a pretty quick one. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.